So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna utilize what we learned about the rules of inference for propositions and the rules of inference for universal quantifiers and then kind of put them together um, in order to generate uh, proof using symbolic logic. So these are symbolic logic proofs. So basically what they are is they're gonna be a stringing together of the rules of inference. Um, also we'll utilize the laws of logic, right? So if you wanna go and look up the laws of logic, those logical equivalences that we had before and um, and we'll use some assumptions in order to prove new statements in fact are true, okay? So if you wanna take a picture, first start out, here are the rules of inference, and here are uh, for our quantifiers, the ones that I went over there, and then here are the rules of inference from, um, from my earlier video, and these charts are actually just from the textbook that we utilize, uh, uh, and so, you know, you can probably find them online. You can find ones for yourself online. And then we also have the laws of logic, and so I'll actually be referencing those, so you may actually want to get out uh, a chart for those as well. Um, so what we'll do is we'll start out with a set of assumptions. And so let's say, for example, I have this set of assumptions right here. I have P implies Q, Q implies R, I have not R, and then therefore not P. And what I want to do is I want to utilize the fact that I know that these three are true, okay? All three of those are true. We're gonna assume that the, assume that they're true, they're gonna be assumptions, and then we're gonna use them to prove this is true. So hence that we actually have a valid argument from logic. So I'm gonna start out, and what I'm gonna do structurally is I'm gonna have a number one, okay? And I'm gonna put in my givens. So I'm actually just gonna start out with P implies Q, and Q implies R. And we'll call those assumptions. So this is assumption, and number two is assumption. And the reason why we're gonna do that is because we're gonna to have to indicate which true statements we'll be using for each one of the, one of the uh, rules of inference that we'll use to prove the next thing is true. So if I look at this, I've got P implies Q and Q implies R, and I'm just gonna go up to my laws of logic, okay? And for right now, I'm gonna do this, but in other times, um, what I'll do is I'll just make reference of them and work from them and assume that you've got some in front of you. If I look here, notice that P implies Q and Q implies R are the assumptions for hypothetical syllogism. So once I get hypothetical, once I have the two assumptions true for hypothetical syllogism, I can have that P implies R. And I know that that's true because these are already valid arguments. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, well three, is then P implies R and that is and what we say it's hypothetical syllogism that's the rule of inference and the one the assumptions that we're using we're using number one and number two for hypothetical syllogism those are the value the values that we're using in order to make that proof right it's like saying okay I, I know that this is true because of this rule of inference and because I know that one and two are also true. There it is. Next up, I'm gonna go four, and I know that P implies R, okay? And if I look up here, I'm gonna see, okay, well, I got P implies R, I need to get to not P, right? And I have not R. Huh, let's put down not R, and that is gonna be an assumption as well. We know that to be true automatically. And let's see if I could find anything that has P implies R and not R. I go up here to my rules of inference and I see, oh, okay, I've got P implies Q, okay, and not Q, and that gives me not P. Oh, great. So in the one that I have, I have not R, okay, if you notice, we're looking at this one here, the modus tollens, I have not R, that's gonna be in the Q place, the conclusion place, and I'm trying to prove not P, it looks like I've got it. I've got it via modus tollens. So what I've done now is I've said, okay, I know that number three is true because one and two are true and hypothetical syllogism. Number four is true by assumption. So these two now become my hypotheses. They're my new hypotheses in my argument. And what they give me is not P. And the logic that we use here is modus tollens and that is modus tollens on three and four 
and we are done. Because notice we have now proven that not P is true. So we started out with our assumptions. We write down what our assumptions are. Then we state, okay, this next statement that I have is gonna be true by this hypothetical syllogism on one and two. Okay, and my assumption, that's my hypotheses. And then my fifth is modus tollens. And that's gonna be utilizing my newly true statement of three and my other assumption of number four. And so that's how basically these proofs work. Now let's take a look at another one, another example. Let's say we have P and Q implies R, then we have not R, and then we have Q. And we wanna show that not P then. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say, okay, well, number one, I've got P and Q implies R. And that's my assumption. And let's actually use not R. Okay, so we got not R. Okay, and that's also our assumption. And now, if you remember, this is actually a modus tollens moment. And I know that I can actually do that. There might be other things, but we're gonna use this one right now. So we're gonna say, okay, well, if I have P and Q implies R, and not R, modus tollens says, right, um, not Q, P implies Q, implies not R, and that's that contra, uh, the contrapositive. So, excuse me, not P, therefore not P. So that's our modus tollens. So that means that I'm gonna get not P and Q. And so there, there's that, okay? And that is by uh, modus tollens. Then what I'm gonna to wanna to do is I'm actually gonna to wanna to bring in the, uh, the negation and I'm gonna use De Morgan's. So that was one of our laws of logic, the De Morgan's laws. And that gives me not P or not Q. Five. Now, I look here, I've got not P or not Q. Okay, and what I wanna think is, is then I have Q. So that means not Q is false. Not Q is false. And, and then consequently, that means that not P must be true. So there's gotta be some kind of rule of inference that'll do that. So I go in here and I'm gonna look and I'm gonna see, okay, well, do I have anything that will do that? Oh, I've got P or Q and then I have not P, therefore Q. Well, I've got not P or not Q, therefore, and I've got Q by assumption. By the way, I forgot here to put in some numbers. This should be modus tollens by one and two. This is De Morgan's law on three. We wanna do that whenever we're doing proofs. Okay, just referencing back to previous proof. Number five, I have Q, okay? And you'll notice, and you're like, oh, isn't that like the opposite of not Q? Well, yeah, it is, but it doesn't quite work. We can't have, logically, we can't just write not Q. We actually need not not Q. We need the negation of this in order to give this to be true, not P to be true. So six, we're actually gonna do not not Q. And not not Q is gonna be double negation on five. Logic's really strict like that. You wanna make sure that you do do things like that because it's got the strictures. And then number seven, all right, now I have the... So now I've got a, just a little bit ways to go and most of this is just gonna be pretty formal. So what I have is I have that rule of logic that we kind of looked at a little bit, the disjunctive syllogism, and that's gonna say P or Q, and then it'll have not P, therefore Q, which makes sense given the fact that if P is not true, P is false, then we know that Q must be true because P or Q is true. Well, if we notice here, I want you to notice that a couple of things. One, that our not Q we don't have actually a Q here, we actually have not Q, okay? We have not Q, and what we need is we need, um, basically we're gonna need that to be not not Q, right? That's why we did the double negation. So if I rewrite this, I wanna get to not P, that's my result that I wanna get here. So therefore not P, okay? 
I have not P or not Q. And so hence, what I'm going to need, well, I'm going to need actually something else. I'm going to need for not P to be here in the Q position. So that means not Q goes over here. And then I'm going to need that not not Q. Okay, notice first position here, we had a P, then we negated it. So now first position becomes not Q, we negate not Q. And then we're looking to get not P, right? So Q, which is in the second position, is our conclusion. So we need to get not P into our second position. Well, we've already got the not not Q. Now what we need to do is we need to go in and we need to flip not P or not Q. So we're going to do that. We're going to use not Q or not P. And that's going to be due to the commutative property on number four. And now, number eight, now we can actually, we have the right form. We have not Q or not P. We have not not Q. And that should give me not P now. And so that means we're going to use number eight. This is going to end up being disjunctive syllogism. That's the name of this particular logic uh, form, disjunctive syllogism. And that'll be disjunctive syllogism on number seven and number eight. And that completes our logic proof. Let's do one more in order to kind of like, uh, kind of solidify this idea of the difference between arbitrary and particular, and also to kind of finish up our rules of inference proofs. So now let's look at this one. We've got for all x, p of x implies f of x. And then for all x, p of x, therefore for all x, p f of x. If you kind of think about it, it makes sense. If p of x is true for every x, and we know the conditional is true for every x, then we know that the conclusion has to be true for every x because if you kind of think about it, for each and every one, we are going to have to have true implies true, true implies true, true implies true, because that's how conditionals work, okay? But that's not how we're going to prove this. We're going to start out by saying, okay, so I've got for all x, p of x implies f of x. And then number two, for all x, p of x. And you'll notice that the solution that I want right here is a universal one. So I'm going to need an arbitrary element. Okay, so this one is one, it's by assumption. Number two is by assumption. Number three, I'm going to say C is an arbitrary element in the domain. And that also, we can pretty much treat that by assumption or hypothesis. Number four, then, is to say that P of C implies F of C. And we also, what we can do, and sometimes we'll do this, is that also that P of C is true. And that's because, and we basically, um, well, you know what, actually, we're going to separate those two. Five is going to be then P of C, just for the sake of ease, and for the sake of our argumentation. And that's going to end up being universal instantiation on one and three. And the reason why I separate it is because this will be universal instantiation. Same reasoning, but different statements. Two and three in this case for number five. So now I have P of C implies F of C, P of C. And so six, right, this is modus ponens, and that's just F of C. So that's modus ponens. Right, you can look that up in your rules of inference. You've got a conditional. You've got the first uh, hypothesis to be true, so that f of c is true. And now, because c is arbitrary, okay, remember that's the key thing that we need inside of universal uh, universal generalization. And we have f of c. f of c is true for arbitrary elements in the domain. That means for all x, f of x. And that's now we add the quantifier in using universal generalization.
and there we go. And that finishes up our proof. Now, let's kind of discuss for a moment what it is exactly that we did, okay? So when we have proofs, one, some things to remember, right? We start with hypotheses that we assume to be true. Then, number two, once we start with the hypothesis that we assume to be true, the rules of inference allow us to conclude new things are true. They allow us to conclude new truths. Okay, three, those new truths become hypotheses for further rules. Our new hypotheses for new statements, or excuse me, for new arguments. So they become part of an argumentation chain for new arguments, okay? And so this is basically what, it, what happens is we're basically gonna like generate new truths, new true statements, becoming hypotheses for the further conclusions, all right? And some things to remember, all right, for strict logic. Now in math, it's a little bit different, uh, but for strict logic, what you wanna make sure is, is make sure that the true statements, right, your new conclusions, and your um, wanted conclusions, so like your desired conclusions, are in the same form as the rules of inference. Same form and position as the rules of inference. Maybe we'll call that A. And then also B, okay, universal or the instantiations, remove quantifiers, and the generalizations add them on. And they add on our quantifiers. And then also remember that for, we wanna get number one, for universal generalization, you'll need an arbitrary element And for existential generalization, you'll need a particular one or arbitrary. It just depends upon the circumstances. But for universal, you're gonna need arbitrary ones. And for existential, you'll just need an individual one, okay? So those actually give us kind of like a, some guidelines for working with our proofs. After that, it's just a matter of practice. Practice and getting to know um, your uh, rules of inference. So you start with a hypothesis that you start assume to be true. The rules of inference then allow you to conclude new truths. This hypothesis, this hypothesis is true, right? So now here's my new truth. Those new truths are now new hypothesis for new arguments, right? We're now going to string on and create new uh, new arguments, okay? And some rules for the road. Make sure that the true statements and your wanted conclusions are in the same form and position as the rules of inference, okay? And then for instantiations, they're gonna remove our quantifiers. Generalizations are gonna add quantifiers. And then universal generalization, in order to do that, you're gonna have to use an arbitrary element. So you're gonna to have to define an arbitrary element for universal generalization. And for existential generalization, you're gonna to have to define a particular one or arbitrary depending upon the kind of activity that you're doing, okay? But if you are going from, if you start out and you say, okay, I've got a universal generalization or excuse me, I, I've got a universal statement, you now can say it's true for an arbitrary element. An existential, uh, uh, existential statement is only true for one element. We only know it's true for one element, maybe more, depending, okay? So just some rules for the red.